is up, everybody? Welcome to another episode of the Hook Shots Podcast. I am your host, Joe Cermelli, and I have decided, yes, I have, that I am going to use this space today for some deep introspection to answer, uh, in loose terms, the question, is the big streamers for trout trend that is happening now in fly fishing good for the sport of fly fishing overall now take a second to gasp go ahead go ahead go ahead it's okay i don't blame you because you're probably thinking like joe what the hell dude you're like you love big streamers okay you love stripping the meat for the brown trouts of course i do yes i do i i I love it very much it is arguably my favorite way to fish for brown trout at this current juncture in my life. It's what I'm all about. It's, it's a thing that I love deeply. But, you know, I, I use the term journalist loosely, right, to describe what I do. Because to me, a journalist is somebody who is uh, unearthing deep, dark secrets that help humanity. Or they're on the front lines you know, in Afghanistan or something and writing for Newsweek and and talking about things that affect lives and the way that people think and uh, uncovering deep injustices in the world. That's what a a real journalist does. Okay, I f***ing write about fishing, okay? It's fishing, okay? It's, it's It's not cures for cancer. So I use the term journalist uh, loosely. However, uh, you know, it's it's sort of in my nature when when you're in media to every once in a while you, you you have to take a look at what other people are doing, what other people are saying, and and sort of consider that and play it against your sort of teachings or thoughts. Okay, and here's what I'm getting at. Here here's what this is all driving back to. So not long ago, right? I'm on Facebook and I'm toggling back and forth between the meme generator of the day. And dogs doing funny shit videos. And what comes across my news feed but a story called Fast Times at Gorilla High. And I have to give a shout out here to uh, podcast fan Grant Meyer because it was actually Grant who had posted this and, and shared this article and he actually has his own podcast called Brown Trout and Bridge Beers, which you guys should check out. But anyway, he posted a link to this article. Uh, that was featured on the website of East Rosebud Fly and Tackle, which I believe is a shop out in Montana, okay? And it was written by uh, the Foul Hooked Whitey. I don't know the guy's real name. That is just his online moniker. But I'm sure some of you have read the work of the Foul Hooked Whitey, okay? Um, I have, you know, off and on over the years. And it's some pretty funny stuff. It's pretty well-written and uh, it's it's pretty funny stuff. And in a nutshell, this article, okay, uh, is about what he calls millennial gorillas. And what a, a millennial gorilla is, is the, you know, 20-something uh, new age fly guy that is interested in nothing except throwing big streamers for the biggest brown trout possible at all times on all waters and is essentially not really interested in doing it any other way ever. Now it's obvious if you read this that that the author himself is a big is a streamer fan, okay? He he likes to fish streamers, okay? Uh but what what's grinding his gears is this sort of uptick in in anglers and i've met them uh some of you probably have too he's he's exactly right who you know yeah you know they'll they'll get out there and they'll put the screws to it all day with the sink tips looking for that goliath brown trout but uh they don't really know how to nymph they don't know how to dry fly fish they can tie a 12 inch long trout streamer but they couldn't tie a parachute atoms and they're essentially just kind of one trick ponies that are focused on one thing and one thing only, and that's the best way to do it as far as they're concerned. So there, there are so many great quotes from this piece that it's not even funny. But here, here are a few of my favorites, okay? 
To a millennial gorilla, casting a standard woolly bugger is like holding an A cup in your hands. Nothing exciting there. Streamer personalities are like rock bands. Kelly Gallup is ACDC, and all the other thousands of streamer-tying YouTube millennial gorillas out there are more like poison. Let's face it, there's a lot of fans that really like poison, but that doesn't mean that poison is getting nominated to the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame anytime soon. There's only one other thing more obnoxious than another millennial gorilla streamer tying video on YouTube, and that's having to hear every rose has its thorn one more f***ing time. And one of my final favorites, the reality of modern day streamer fishing is that a lot of millennial gorillas think they're experts at the art of angling with a streamer, yet most of these same gorillas couldn't hold Bob Clouser's jock strap when it comes to bringing fish to the hand. So while I cannot read this whole thing, uh, you know, I think that you get the idea, okay? And after reading this, I started to think, hmm, there's actually some, some decent points brought up about modern streamer culture in this article. And then I started to think, shit, am I an enabler? Am I part of the problem? And what I mean by that is, you know, I've produced a lot of content from, from videos to podcasts, to articles in print, you know, expressing my personal love of throwing big streamers for big brown trout. I I got sucked right into the whole scene years ago when suddenly, you know, articulated streamers became all the rage and fell in love with it. You know, and when you do what I do, you naturally, you get the most enjoyment out of talking about the things that you are personally into. You know what I mean? Like I've written, I don't know how many articles on spring crappie fishing in the South and Midwest. And as a quote unquote journalist, if you want to use the term, anybody worth their salt, you got contacts, you pick up the phone, you call the best guys, you get the information, you do the story. But is it as exciting for me to write about Southern crappies as it is fly fishing for big brown trout with streamers, no. So you, you gravitate towards what you love. And and what this article kind of made me realize was that, yeah, there is sort of a growing number of, of younger fly, fly fishermen who have adopted this style of fishing, and that's all that matters in the world. And it makes you question you know, for the overall health of a sport, because everybody's always complaining about, we need more anglers, we need more hunters, right? We need to sell more licenses, we need to get more kids involved. Um, you know, is that necessarily a, a good thing for fly fishing for trout? Now, on one hand, any anything that prompts anybody to pick up a rod and go do it, that's that's awesome, okay? And, you know, <laughs> in no way is what we're talking about here, nor this article saying like, Streamer's bad. Don't streamer fish. No, streamer fishing is the shit, man. You know, and it's very effective. You don't have to be a new school streamer guy. Okay. You could have been fishing since uh, 1952. You probably threw some streamers and caught some fish. The question becomes, you know, having a, a sort of a one track mind in your fly fishing, does that make you a, a well rounded fly fisherman? And I think that's a pretty simple answer. No, it does not. Does it help grow the sport? as a whole, okay? And that's that's sort of one of the things that we're going to touch on because I am not a millennial gorilla. I am not a millennial, first of all, but um I I got into the whole streamer thing much later. I mean, that's certainly not what I grew up doing, you know? I grew up nymphing at Ken Lockwood Gorge in New Jersey and dry fly fishing in the Poconos in PA. And the streamer game was just sort of part of a, a long progression. Because you're always interested in what's new and cool. I mean, you could say the same thing almost of Tenkara. You know, when Tenkara rods first came out, I, I was really interested in trying one. I wanted to see what that was all about. I wrote a column about it. And I actually thought that in the right time and place, Tenkara, um, you know, it had, some, it had some merit. You know what I mean? And I caught a lot of fish that season messing around with Tenkara rods. Uh, because, you know, I, I, if I'm going to write something about it, I want to be as well versed in it as I can possibly be if I'm not leaning on other experts for information. And you know what happened? I had a great time to car fishing for a season, caught a whole bunch of fish, 
and I haven't touched the damn ten car rod since. It's they've been sitting in my garage buried, God knows where for I don't know five years now. And I think that one of the the biggest differences between guys like me who who latched onto this later versus the the, the younger generation now that's diving right into that, um, you know. <laughs> For for me, you work up to big fish, right? You know, you just start fly fishing. You just want to catch anything. And then, you know, you want to catch it on a dry fly. And you want to catch it on this river because this river is harder. And you sort of – you you build up. And then here's this interesting new tactic that might catch me the biggest brown that I've ever caught. And therefore, I think you appreciate that catch when it happens a lot more because you – have evolved as a fly fisherman. And this could be said of any fishery, right? Like nobody just throws, you know, trout size swim baits for largemouth. Okay. If you do, I mean, that's crazy. Yeah. You catch bigger ones than everybody else, but what do you really know? What is that really teaching you about bass behavior in different seasons and different times of year? You know, it's, it's, it's like, it stops you from getting the, the full picture. So if you're a beginning fly fisherman and you're throwing meat, the big meat, okay, you, you've, you've bought into the tactic and your first couple of fish are, are tanks that took other guys years to build up to, are you really getting a full appreciation for the entire game, you know? So now this, this topic, this, this sort of introspection, uh, it gave me a great opportunity to get somebody on the podcast that I've been dying to have on, and I've just been waiting for the right time, and uh, I, I, I think that this was it, and that is my uh, very good friend, Kirk Dieter. Now, I first met Kirk way back in 2005 when I was an intern at Saltwater Sportsman, and he I absolutely consider Kirk to be one of my mentors in this business. Uh, Kirk, as a writer, he's, he's a tremendous writer. But he has always been, in my opinion, sort of a, a step ahead of the game uh, and a step ahead of trends. Like as an example, Kirk wrote about fly fishing for Mako sharks in Field and Stream back in 2005. This is pre-Instagram, pre-Facebook, okay? That stuff's, you know, all over Facebook now. And in fact, we've had Conway Bowman, who was the pioneer of it, that Kirk fished with on this very podcast. Kirk wrote about that in 2005. I saw that article. I was like, damn. You know, Kirk was fly fishing for carp before it was cool to fly fish for carp. The first the first mention I ever heard of anybody fly fishing for carp was, was Kirk Dieter. Okay. And Kirk ha- has, has gone on. I mean, not only is he the editor of Angling Trade Magazine, which is the official trade magazine of the fly fishing industry, he is also in charge of all media for TU. Okay, from their digital efforts to Trout Magazine. So when it comes to the pulse of, of trends and, and goings on in the fly world and, and the trout fishing world for that matter, uh, I mean, Kirk is, Kirk is on it. And Kirk is also the classic example of one of those guys that like has been there and done that. I mean, if, if, if you've been reading Field and Stream for the last 10 years or so, I mean, the, 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 the places that he's been and written about are, are stuff that even me, and I get around, could only dream of. You know what I mean? Like, he was hitting arapaima on the fly before I ever saw anybody else catch an arapaima on the fly. Not saying he was the first. I'm just saying it's not that hard to find sexy videos of arapaima on fly these days. Kirk wrote about that for Field and Stream years and years ago. You know, Dorado in remote places. I mean, he has just been around the block. So he's got so much experience with so many different tactics and just the overall well-being state of fly fishing that I thought he was a really great person to talk to for this. And I'm really honored to be able to call Kirk a friend. And like, he's not like a friend that we, you know, we just talk on the phone. No, like he slept on my futon in my condo before I even owned a home, you know, he, Kirk put in a good word for me to be picked as the new fishing editor at Field and Stream Magazine. Kirk and I have driven from New Jersey to New Brunswick, Canada, to the Miramichi together, some ridiculous 1800 mile round trip over dirt roads with no lights for a hundred miles, swerving around moose and all kinds of wacky stuff. Kirk and I have been in some shit together and Kirk also loves him 
some streamer fishing, okay? But he has loved him some hardcore streamer fishing long before anybody ever heard of the Double Deceiver. So in sort of looking at what this culture is doing to benefit and not benefit fly fishing as a whole, I was really pumped that Kirk said he would belly up to the bar today to weigh in. Hello, this is Kirk. KD. What's going on, man? What a surprise. <laughs> you had no idea I was calling, did you? I had no idea. Wow. I, Joe, how have you been, man? Good. Good. I know. It's like we're, we're talking for a podcast and we haven't just yucked it up in so long. We're so busy. We're busy people, Kirk. I know. It's, it's a good thing, right? You wouldn't want it any other way. No, that's true. I, I, I got to tell you, though, if I'm being honest, I'm surprised that I got you. Shouldn't you be in like a dugout canoe casting a fly at a species only four people have caught minus no. natives that wear leaf like leaves over their privates somewhere no i i, I retired from that shit i'm on the luxury <laughs> i'm on the luxury lodge plan now You're... and uh <laughs> i am going to tasmania i'm going uh in a couple well december 1st through the 15th okay but you're you don't bushwhack anymore is what you're telling me no, no, no! I'm no, I'm, I'm going to go and fly in helicopters and fish and you know, yeah. I've graduated. Well, somebody needs to pick up where you left off, man. I don't know who it is. That's, I, that's I, you. Let's yeah, go. it's I, me. I, get, I put you right there in the jungle. Uh, yeah. You'll, you'll you'll regret it every minute. But that's I, a I, great story. I know that I'll regret it every minute, dude. I mean, I've read stories of yours like yeah, anywhere I have to go to fly fish, where somebody needs to wear a mask on the back of their head. While walking, yeah. so as not to get attacked by a jaguar, I don't really need to fucking be there. You know, I yeah. just you know, <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. Well, you know, it, what doesn't kill you makes you stronger, and it was fun and, and, and all that. But uh, yeah, every once in a while, I'll do. I want to, if you want to go, I'll go with you. Oh yeah, but, uh, okay, all right. We we yeah, I'll go with you and. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> we, I'll have your back, but that's it. That's it. I won't. I, I'm kind of. I'm just kind of mellowed with age. I play golf now. Oh no, not the G word. Yeah, I play golf. I, you know, my son. He Paul is 18. He's going to go to college next year. I know. The last time I saw him, I was helping him with like his spelling homework at your house in Colorado, <laughs> and he was like eight. Right. Right. So he's he's. He's going to the University of Nebraska to be a golf pro. He's, no way. He's going to be a teaching pro, and they've got a program that teaches him how to manage, you know, businesses and learn about the turf and the golf conditions. And that's something he just got into, and that's his deal. So, wow, man, good for that's oh, that's awesome. Damn, that's so cool. I'm kind of on the rush to try to do stuff with him before I'm an empty nester because he's our only <laughs> yeah. kid, right? And, yeah. Well, you so, know, you know what's funny about that? It's like you know, I, I have a, a little son now too, and there's yeah, like of course. everybody has that dream of like your kid following in your footsteps. But like, dude, your son's going to make a lot more money doing that than being an outdoor writer. So like, oh good, no, no, good, no, good, for, yeah. <laughs> good for him. Man. You, you know what he likes though? He's really good at hunting. Yeah. Um. So he likes fishing too, and he rows the boat and all that stuff. But I took him elk hunting, uh -huh. and he shot up. He shot a bull elk. Nice. One shot, dropped nice. it. Nice. Bow or, stone cold dead. Bow or gun? With a rifle. With a rifle? He's a little sniper. He shot a 7 millimeter Remington Magnum, which is about as big as he is. Right, right. <laughs> <laughs> but he's, he's all business with that stuff. And he actually took, a, we had a friend of ours, nephew, who's was in the British SAS and was a sniper. Okay. And took Paul out and for a whole day at the range and, like, taught him things. Wow. And then Paul practiced all summer, like, breathing techniques, or he would balance a twenty two shell on the end of his barrel and dry fire the gun without knocking the shell off, you know, yeah. so he could click. And just timing and technique and tempo. And then when it came to shooting the elk the other day, he was like, should I take the shot? I was like, yep. Three, two, one, bang! Just wow. dead right there. Good for 218, him. Yeah, two hundred and eighteen yards. Uh, 
clean, good stuff. And so I'm really proud of him. He, you'd like to hang out with him. He's fun. I did. I, I would. I have like I said, I haven't seen him since he was little. So is dad now on the hook for the mount? No, this is like, thank God dad was smart enough. Not to, we saw like a big five by five, you know, that we were going to chase around. And this one came in, it was a raghorn bully four by four. Right. So not, not really big, but good eating younger, sure, you know, so like sure. better to eat. Well, so we we cut off the antlers and they're hanging in the garage, but I didn't have to do a full mount for that. <laughs> well, dude, I begged for fish mounts since I was like old enough to speak, and my dad finally gave in. But like many many years down the road, but now every time I'm fishing with somebody and their kid and their kid catches a good fish, I'm always that dick that's like, you should you ask Santa for a mount for Christmas, <laughs> man. I'd have that one mounted, and like everybody's always like, shut up, dude, shut up, shut up. But anyway, so, That's awesome. yeah. so Tasmania, I knew you were going to Tasmania and, and this, this sort of fulfills, you and I are lovers of the brown trout, right? Yes. Yes. And you have, you have sort of made it a personal quest to fish the roots of the brown trout. I mean, you fished in a, in a lot of places of origin, right? Yes. So like I learned to fly fish on the Baldwin river. Right. That's our family cabin is on the Baldwin and that's where the first brown trout was planted right. in the United States in 1884. Right, right. And you can walk to the railroad trestle where they were planted from, from our family cabin. I mean, it's right there. Yeah. My first fish ever was a brown trout uh, on a fly. And it's just odd that, you know, 30, 35 years later, um, here I am flying around chasing the same damn fish, yeah. but yeah. Well, you, yeah. What, did, what did you say? You said something like Tasmania was what? That was the first place outside their native range they were ever implanted, or something like that. That's right. That's right. So before they went to New Zealand, or before South Africa, or Chile, or the United States, in 1863, I think it was, in the mid 1860s at least, they were taken by ship from and, and as eggs and, so, and maybe fry I, i've got to look into it more i'm going to learn all about it but that was where they were planted first right in tasmania and then they did well in tasmania and from there that's where they lifted them and took them over to new zealand right and took them elsewhere and it was kind of ironic it was kind of just like the had, preceding that was when they were taking all the prisoners out of england and ireland right 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 to tasmania and botany bay and the prison colonies down there and so and those brown trout were kind of the same in the same boat, literally. Yeah, and and they went down and uh, flourished, and thus begins that saga. And I think Tasmania tourism, or Australia tourism, and Tasmania in particular, has invited me because they really wanted to. Um, I think there's, they're a little upset that many Americans. We'll go to New Zealand, you know, and I talk about it, talk about it as a life trip, life trip. Sure. Right? But they were kind of the original game for exotic Southern Hemisphere I, and see, brown trout. And, and, and I'm, a, I'm a brown trout freak, and I, I did not know that. That's that's news to me. But, I, I mean, I know you've been to Scotland and Iceland. Have you done the Black Forest? I, I, it's, no, it's, hard, it's hard to fish there, right? Right. So I think it's almost all private and everything, but I – I make no secret, Joe. Like I, I, I see a book eventually that kind of ties this whole thing. It's like right. a life of brown trout. I, I was going to bring it up if you didn't. I know that you've always said someday you're going to do just this epic brown trout book from your travels. Right, and it would be an homage to the fish. Not not so much a how to, where to, but like touching a little bit on some of that. But mostly, you know, homage and how this lifelong fascination with an a fish that's just an immigrant fish. Right. You know, it's not an invasive fish. It's an immigrant fish. Right, right. And like the rest of us are. Right. You know, we're all descended. And uh, Tasmania is like, it's almost like I'm going in reverse because Tasmania is then the original southern hemisphere place where it was planted. And the last link in the chain would be to go to like both the chalk streams in southern England yeah. and the Schwarzwald or Black Forest in Germany. Yeah, yeah. Well, I I couldn't do the chalk streams because I cur I'm too loud. I curse too much. Like when when <laughs> when, when I f something up, I'm you know I, I lose my shit and I'm like 
You know, that's I, all right. They, I'd have to get. You a, just have to say, use like Euro words. Yeah. You know, like, you know, <laughs> what? Like, blast. <laughs> you know. I'd have, I have to train myself real hard, and I'm too fat yeah. for like. I'd have to get a custom tweed jacket made. But anyway, yeah, that's right. someday I cannot wait to to read that book. But it's it's great that we are such lovers of brown trout because ultimately, like what we wanted to talk about today. I mean, dude, I consider you whether you agree with me or not. Like you've just got your finger more on the pulse and 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 of of the fly fishing industry in in general because you're the editor of Angling Trade and you've always dude as long as I've known you you you've always seemed to be one step ahead you know writing about things that at the time nobody knew a damn thing about that became something later fly fishing for makos the first time I ever read about fly fishing for carp was something you wrote. Years before anybody was making fly fishing, you know, carp lines and specific carp tackle. So, I mean, you know, in 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 sort of the the, the summarized version, like you know, what's the hot button? What's what's the state of, of of fly fishing in the U.S. right now? That's a big question, but yeah, it is. It's a good question, and well, thanks for your kind words. And I, you know, it goes right back on you. First of all, <laughs> I've always thought that you were on the ragged edge yourself, man, and that's why well you're. The, well, you're the fishing editor of the world's most prestigious outdoors brand. I know, I know, with, I know you had a little nudge in that, and I will always be well, grateful with, for with that. with good reason. And, uh, you know, it's always fun to see where you are and what you're doing. And, you know, you, you've got equally the, the pulse of everything, but I appreciate you saying that about me. And, uh, you know, I think fly fishing's in a good spot in general. Um, it's, 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 Becoming more diverse, I think that's the thing that I'm most happy about. I see a lot more women taking part in the sport, younger people, um, people you know fishing in cities, people fishing for carp and other species, people crossing over and you know mix, mixing conventional tackle or you know people who are bass anglers picking up a fly rod and trout anglers just starting to throw poppers for bass. I think. All those things are generally good. Sure, you know, uh, I like I like that, and I think it, it, the, the, to be on the next edge or to next, you know, where are we going? I think it's more diversifying technique. You know, so okay. I was talking to you the other day about this, but there's so many people want to go out and chase like a oh I want a grand slam right in saltwater. They want to catch a bonefish, a tarpon, and a permit on the same day. Awesome, right, right. Or they're, or they're trout fishing, and they can go to a place and they can catch a brook trout, a brown trout, and a rainbow trout, or a cutthroat, or whatever, depending on where you are. <clears throat> I think it's even more of a challenge and a better challenge now for people to chase a technique slam. Okay. Try to try to catch a fish on a dry fly, on a streamer, and on a nymph in the same day. Sure, sure. Because so, so many people get pigeonholed. Well, you know, like they're like, <clears throat> I'm going to be the streamer dude now. Well, okay, that's fine. Right, and you're you're you're, but, you're setting me up to knock it down because that's that's sort of like the angle that I, I wanted to talk about here. So, you know, I um I, I'm I'm a streamer freak. I make you know, I don't try and hide that. I write about it often. People know that, and you know, I I actually think you are too. And and looking back to the first time I ever fished with you in Colorado, I mean, this is going back to God 2008. I mean, the first time I ever heard the word, uh, you know, sex dungeon, in a, at least in a fly fishing connotation, right, was uh, <laughs> was from you and, right. and, and the zoo cougar and all these, right. these Kelly Gallup flies that at the time yeah. I'd never heard of and, frankly, nobody was, was actually talking about. And um, we knew fishing the Colorado on that trip that it was high and it was going to be a streamer game. And dude, you were doing shit like, and I still do it now. The the Kirk Dieter salt and pepper rig, man, a white streamer yeah. and a black streamer, two streamers on the same line to throw right. different contrasts. So I know that I mean, you are a lover of streamer fishing. You always have been, and that goes back well before this became sort of a cult, you know, trendy type of thing. Um, but with that in mind, I mean, do you agree that it's? Um, I mean, it, it's blown up to where uh, so many people, that's sort of all they want to do now. It's just become the, the in way to fish. I mean, do you see that? I totally see that. I, t I totally see it. I, I think it's a total joke. And here's why. Because for how many years do we, you know, stereotype the fly fisherman as some old guy smoking a pipe, wearing tweed? Of course. 
walking along, and he's a dry fly purist. Well, all this is is another subset of people who, you know, now they got the trucker hat and the right. Civil War Civil War general beard and uh, <laughs> smoking a different kind of pipe and blah blah blah. But they, you're always doing this, replacing one stereotype with another, right? Right. So, and that's never like. I don't care how you look or where you fish or how you fish. Or, I mean, it's all good. I'm inclusive. I, I love my bro brothers and all that stuff. No offense meant to any of that. But, like, anyone who just puts on the blinders and says, my brand of fishing is, like, the it way to do it and doesn't dabble, like I said, you know, a good day is when you catch fish different ways all day. Sure. I think they're just selling yourself short. I mean, you're totally allowed to do it. More power to you. God bless you. But... Like, don't act like it's the hip or in or cool or smart thing to, like, put blinders on yourself as you go into a river. Well, it's a, it's a funny thing, right? It's a fine line because – and I've said this in other podcasts and I, I stand by it. You know, I think that, that streamer fishing has been a, a gateway in for a lot of conventional guys that never touched a fly rod but – you know, that style of fishing appeals to them so much more than dry fly fishing because it's so much more akin to throwing a spinner or jerk bait or something that, you know, that, that speaks to them. But I think, um, you know, what, what happens is, um, like you say, you know, what, what's bad is when, when that does become sort of the only way, you know, like I, like you, Fell in love with that stuff, you know, as part of a progression from starting out with learning to cast a dry fly to learning how to nymph and, you know, learning how to use a woolly bugger. And then when all this big stuff came along, you know, it intrigued me. But it's the guys that, that don't have that progression that just sort of step right into that. Uh, that, you know, I mean, it's it's interesting to me because with your role in, in TU, you know, a lot of your bread and butter – revolves around, you know, the wellness of, of all trout fisheries, not just trophy trout fisheries. So, right. I mean, how does that affect, you know, the next generation coming up if maybe a lot of them don't care about catching a fish that's not 20 inches or better? Yeah, that's a great point. I mean, I've, I've also struggled with how do we define trophy? Sure. Right. For me, I can catch an eight inch cutthroat trout in the backcountry and I consider that a trophy. Right. Um, you know, for other reasons. And it's not, you know, this, you know, stare at your navel, uh, granola, greeny right. thinking in my brain. Right. It's right. Like, I really come to appreciate that. But, the, the, you know, the, and there's something to be said. I'm, again, I'm, the, the guys who, you know, just ripping lips and blah, blah, blah. That it does sometimes, um, it's just not not my gig, you know. It's, I'm, I'm not here to criticize them, but like, you got to be careful if you're serious about a catch and release ethic, right? Right. Right. Uh, you know, practice what you preach. Don't catch and release a 25 fish with a giant staff streamer with you know a brain pin hook on it, right? And think you're doing right by the resource. I mean, just call it like it is. Like, be honest with yourself. You know, if you, and then, like, if you're going to catch a few fish that way or you're going to catch, you know, and you handle them the right way and you're keeping them in the water and, okay, well, that's real catch and release fishing. But, like, if you're just pulling fish around by their faces until they're exhausted and you're using, like, oversized tackle and not really caring about the fish, but then you wear the the guys or the, the outfit or the hat that says, yeah, I'm a catch and release, I'm a conservationist. Well, then sure. you're really a wolf in sheep's clothing in that way. And those are the most dangerous kind of anglers for conservation, I think. More so, far, far, far more so than the guy who, you know, goes out, catches a couple, puts them in the creel and eats them for dinner on Saturday night. Right. Sure. Sure, and that's the, the yeah, that's the biggest taboo. How can you be a fly guy and never eat a trout? But you're you're <laughs> right. You're doing less damage catching a couple and eating them, you know, in 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 certain situations. Um, yep. And when you talk about beating up on a resource, I've I've heard it said, and and honestly, I, I never gave it much thought, and I, I won't say who said it, but you know, if you look at a lot of rivers that are. are you know, trophy trout rivers historically, you know, in the early season in, in March or April or whenever, you know, the season opens, 
that sort of time of year, right, was sort of a mellow time for the fish. You know, there's not a lot of bugs going. They're not necessarily feeding super hard. The water is cold. And now in a lot of places, those are the conditions that, you know, these – the hardcore streamer guys yeah. want and and they, they, they look for. Um, so it's been said that, you know, well, because of this, this – uptick in streamer culture and, and guys wanting to streamer fish as opposed to waiting for the Hendrickson's to go or whatever it is on the East coast early season. Now these fish are just generally speaking, getting beat on and pressured longer than they ever had before. You, you, yeah. you agree with that? Well, I agree with that. And I, I think it's a real, well, I gonna say I, it's, it's a dick move to, um, Streamer fish to spawning fish, for example, you know, fish on reds, um, and then you know, and and it's it's kind of not cool, I don't think, really, right? To, but that's to, that's a fall deal you're talking about, right? Yeah, 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 right. Well, brown trout it is for sure, sure. and and then and that would go the same for rainbows in the spring, um, but it's also you know, like say the epic hatch is on, right? I'm on the Missouri River and I'm fishing a, a beta hatch that's come off, and some guy, you know, floats by and guide. Most guides don't do this. Most guides will tell their people, "Hey, crank up! This guy's on a pot of fish, and let him go or sure. let her go." Um, and but they, you know, you, you don't throw a, a streamer in that kind of water. You know, you don't throw a streamer into a dry fly hatch. Right. That's, right. That's a, just rude. That's, that's, I'm not, again, it's not me telling you how to fish. It's it's me saying. Be considerate of other anglers, and and that I don't know that there even has to be another angler in the water fishing that run with the heads coming up, but like even if they're not and the fish are feeding actively and they're happy and they're doing their thing, to just kind of shuffle the deck or stir things up by throwing some freaking three inch zonker through the middle of that thing, it just you know you can do it if you want to, but it's just I kind of like to be more in tune with what's going on. Let the fish be happy. Sometimes you've got to cheer for the fish, right? Sure, sure. So, well, I mean, and, and that said, you bring up a good point. So knowing um, that, that you do love streamer fishing, I mean, when when are you doing that, Kirk? Are you doing that only when the conditions dictate that that's what you need to do to catch fish? Or do you admittedly, you know, you know get the bug like, I want to go out there and strip some meat? Yeah, you know, both. And, and, and again, both are f- fine, but... Like say I'm on I'm, I'm on the Colorado River and usually I'm in a boat and then usually I'm rowing but like I have folks with me and and like um, early season late season you know pulling streamers along the bank is some of the most rewarding type of fishing that you can do and I, I, that would almost be my first choice. See what I like about streamer fishing and dry fly fishing nymph fishing's fine too but nymph fishing as you remember I I spent a lot of time. Uh, doing the underwater scuba stuff. Oh, uh, yeah. Going deep. Yeah, some of the most, yeah, exactly. You, you, you were right? in full scuba gear watching how trout reacted to a nymph coming overhead, one of the coolest pieces we ever did. Right, so, well, thanks. And and But it, going deep in the name of trout research, and I spent hours down there watching. And the bottom line is they'll eat a nymph if it's close enough or it hits them in the face. So really that's kind of a force feeding, and you're, you're you know, it's almost like if you poke a dog in the nose, enough he's gonna nip at you sure. sooner or later sure sure well the, the trout are down there and they're eating everything they folks they eat leaves they and they spit it back out but they'll eat leaves they'll eat bugs they eat different stuff and as it floats by and if it's just you know it's a matter of figuring out the right weight but if you bonk them in the head odds are they're going to eat it now whether you're quick enough to to stick them react yeah. and set the hook you yeah. know you know that that's a whole different thing and the best anglers in the world can only do it about 50% of the time. Yeah. So, yeah. But that's force feeding. Back to streamers, streamer feeding or streamer fishing is making the fish react in a different way, a more predatory way, or, um, you know, making a choice to eat something. And that's the same with dry fly fishing. So I kind of consider streamer fishing and dry fly fishing the same in that you're not really – Forcing a bite, you're matching some kind of forage, you're making them want to eat something, and and typically the bigger fish will eat, you know, they get more protein, more bang for the buck. 
uh, if they're chasing a streamer or eat another fish. So different times of the day, you know, early early in the day, um, you know, mornings, I love to streamer fish, middle of the afternoon, if there's nothing hatched going on. But I guess that's really what I focus first, and I'm always looking at the water. And if I see a hatch going on, I, I go dry flash. Sure, and, and that's and that's how, I mean, that's the same way I am. I mean, I don't ever want anybody to have the impression that I am that streamer guy, that it's like a streamer or nothing. I will right. never float by heads up and not make the switch. You know, I would never blow that off. But, I mean, I just, I think there is, it is fair to say, you know, there is a growing number of, of, of streamer guys that would. And, you know, part of that you can't deny is because of, you know, Instagram, man. Everybody wants the picture of, yeah. of the giant, you know what I yeah. mean, for for, yeah. for Instagram. Um, you know, and I mean, do, do you think, you know, I look at carp fishing and that was raging for years. You remember, yeah. like for a few years there. Holy yeah. shit. Everybody had a carp rod. Everybody had a carp line. I, I was yeah. so sick of watching carp fly videos. And the funny thing is a lot of that stuff, it was just like bass tapered rods and lines that they made a different color and slapped a carp on the box. Like it wasn't even really anything I would say was specially designed for carp. But I mean, that was that was raging for so long. And now I feel like I mean, I still love to do that, and a lot of people still love to do that. It's just no longer in the forefront, and I don't think it ever will be again. But do you think – go, go ahead, go ahead. Well, I, I, I agree with you. I would add the caveat that most anglers realize they weren't good enough to catch carp. Uh, you know what? I, I, <laughs> I have two good friends who are guides who, when I first met them – were so hyped up on carp, they offered that as a service. And offering that service did not last very long because, you know, exactly. I mean, you see the picture, and if you've never done it before and you want to catch a 15-pound carp on the fly, the odds of you booking a single day and getting that done yeah. for so many reasons are, are yeah. so slim. So I would agree with that wholeheartedly that carp definitely dropped off because as people got interested – you know, it's like anything, you do it a couple times, and if you're not successful those first couple times, you drop it. Yeah. But I think... I think <laughs> and we live in an instant gratification society now, right? Right. right. And that's that's what nymph fishing is all about, right, too. I mean, if I'm a guide and I want to, you know, am I going to sit around and wait for the hatch with somebody who's paying me 500 bucks? Right. Or am I going to put on a bobber and a rig and put flies in the face of a fish because I know the fish is going to eat it, and this person, if they're quick enough, I know that they're going to have something in the net, they're going to take the picture, they're going to go home, they're going to tell their friends, and they're going to be happy. Right. And I'm a, gr I'm a great guide then. Right. Of course. But it's really a matter of, are you imposing your will on the fish, or are you letting the fish dictate, and are you smart enough to react? Sure. In carp, you don't you don't have that choice. You know, carp is a very difficult fish to impose your will on that fish. You're right. You're right. You have to be totally tuned in, and that's why they're so hard, and that's why some people are weird, like you and me, who like them. Right. And, and some people will never fish for them. And I think that it's getting that way. And, and this, going back to your streamer point, you know, it's like that's maybe imposing your will on the fish. You make them an offer they can't refuse. It's an it's amazing eat, amazing fight, amazing take. It's totally worth it. But I'm, I would encourage people to, you know, allow yourself to sit back and grow a little bit more as an angler and, let the fish dictate what goes on. Sure. And, and, I mean, I think one of the greatest differences, though, like if you're comparing, you know, the, the rising streamer trend with, you know, the carp trend, uh, you know, a while back, um, you're right. You know, a lot of people trailed off on carp because they realized, like, this is really friggin' difficult. Like, this takes some dedication. There is no instant right. gratification. But, I mean, would you not say that, you know, I think one of the reasons why the streamer deal is trending is because while – Throwing, you know, sinking lines and big flies all day is is definitely work, okay? While it might take a lot of time and dedication to get what you'd consider, you know, a true high-caliber tank, right? I mean, I don't know what your biggest wild brown is on the fly, but, you know, mine is 25 inches, which as it goes, there's a lot bigger fish out there than that, right? And I've been doing it for a long time, but my what I'm driving at is... 
it's a lot easier to see sort of a return on investment. Like, you know, you spend a good day on a good river throwing streamers for 45 minutes, you're probably going to at least move something. Might might not be a giant, but you're going to move fish. You're going to stick smaller fish. So, therefore, it just keeps you more engaged, you know, than than carp fishing would, perhaps. Yeah, I totally, I totally agree. It's like you're 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 constantly thinking, you're constantly working. You know, when you're streamer fishing, you're covering water, you're um, you, you're forcing the action. I, I I totally buy that. I think it's great too. And uh, you know, there's a time and place for everything, and I, I think that that's it. You know, I I certainly rather than twiddling my thumbs and just waiting for something to happen, like I said earlier, I'd love to bang the banks with streamers and see what happens and 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 i'm also it's a cliche but big fish eat big flies and i know this it's true i mean because they get to they a trout will eat insects primarily until it reaches a certain size right and then after that the return on his investment is not enough by sucking down midges i mean sure he's going to eat midges but if he can eat a mouse or if he can eat, a, you know, another fish, um, because he's 24 inches long and he needs to, uh, have that many calories to sustain his body weight and be healthy, that's where they go for. Sure. So, sure. you know, it's, it's all true. So, and I, I certainly don't, if anyone's serious about catching a big brown trout, I mean, you've asked me how you're going to catch one, whether it's here or, or in Michigan or, Montana or South America, whatever, it's, you know, streamers are probably your best chance for a big brown trout. Sure, sure. No, and, and, and I would agree with that. Um, you know, I, I once did a, a poll, I think you were part of it, uh, you know, and one of the questions I asked for this magazine piece was over the course of your season, you know, what's ultimately going to catch your, your biggest trout of the year, streamer, nymph, or dry? And actually the answer to that question from from all the guides, all the fly guides that I polled was – Nymph. And I mean, I don't disagree with that because you're talking about, you know, over the course of a season, logic would dictate, you know, feeding happens underwater, you know, so that's that that that's ultimately what would probably account for your biggest fish of the year. But yeah, I mean, I, it's just a matter of, you know, getting that biggest fish of the year the way that you want to get it versus, like you said, you know, force feeding that fish or, or, or doing it in such a way that you don't have the glory of, of seeing that fish come shoot off the bank and, and eat yeah. the fly. Um, you know, but I, I guess, you know, with, with the streamer deal, I mean, what is it that you think has sort of created this, this monster? If that's, if that's the way to put it, is it the, the tires that are making stuff that nobody has ever seen before, um, you know, is it just the ease in which, you know, people can, can put a big brown trout grip and grin in <clears> front <throat> of the world? You know, what, 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 if you had to peg sort of the element that, that, that set it off? Uh, this is going to sound really weird, but I, I think it's pressure. I think it's angler pressure. Really? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So let me follow my logic here. Um, I think enough people, go to places like Cheeseman Canyon in Colorado, right? Yeah. And they throw in little tiny RS2s and black bitties and all that stuff. And he's pounding the snot out of the fish. Right? And then they, you get to a place that's maybe not as pressured, but you can see that, uh, you know, uh, a fish will attack on the Colorado River, uh, a big streamer, an articulated streamer. And you see that and you experience that and the word out. And yeah, social media is a huge part of it too. But they realize, hey, these fish aren't these fish aren't the wusses that we think they are. Right. You know. Right. And no one wants to catch a wuss fish. Right. Right. So you get a brown trout with a hooked jaw and some teeth in it, and he's come out and eating a streamer, and and people hear that, and you find some of these bigger fish and better streamer water in places that are slightly less pressured so the angler finds a little bit more solitude. And that all those ingredients put together. So on the one hand, you've got the demand shaped, shaped by the social media and so more people are interested in doing it, but yet the, you know, 
they don't want to do the same old, same old, and they don't want to stand and look at a bobber and throw tiny little flies all day. I think that the dynamic of people finding their spot on the river has what's led to the streamer explosion. Sure, sure. Does that make sense? I mean, it's a, it's a weird kind of convoluted theory, but I think that people, um, yeah, I, I also think it's an instant gratification thing. You know, you don't have to have fished for 40 years and you don't have to match the hatch perfectly and you can use a big gaudy thing and you can learn some simple casts and some simple techniques and you figure out the cadence of how fast you strip the fly and find the right sink tip or floating tip or whatever you want to do. You get yourself dialed in, and then, man, you can you can be a trophy hunter. Well, right there. Okay, and you're right. And you you actually made that sound very eloquent, and 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 I agree with that. I mean, there is there is a fair amount that goes into dialing in a setup and 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 things like that. But I mean, would you agree that that part of the, I guess, if there was you know a, a, a sort of a negative connotation towards the the streamer culture, do you think that traditional guys uh, look at it as very dumbed down fly fishing. Yes, I do. Yeah, I'm just beyond be be honest with you. I mean, I think, so, and I'm not trying to put words in some of their mouths, but like, I mean, and and Ernest Schwebert, right, uh, right. What would he think of the streamer fishing and and that he would think that it's a bunch of bullshit, right? I think, right, right. Well, and that's so funny that you bring up him because. Man, like uh, you and I have talked about this so many times. Um, why can I not think of the what is the L- Latort Latort Spring yeah. Run? Okay, because you're originally from Pennsylvania, so you have fished Latort Spring Run. Yeah, and um, you know, I and I think this will this will this will speak to the the difference between the old school guys and the new school guys because I feel like I'm I'm somewhere right in the middle, right? I'm not a millennial. That only knows how to streamer fish and only cares about that. But, you know, I also, you know, I'm not that old, so I, I have only so many years in. So I'm, I'm in the weird middle. So you look at Latour's Spring Run, which I've been to a handful of times. How yeah. iconic is that stream, right? Some, oh, yeah. it, it, this is, for anybody who doesn't know, this is a limestoner, I don't know, about an hour west of Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, in the limestone belt there. You could pretty much jump across the river in all spots mm-hmm. it's this tiny little nothing and you know it weaves through all this soft grass and like you know you break your ankle walking into the damn thing in most places because it's all soft bottom and but historically i mean some of the most iconic dry fly patterns were created there and fished there first by guys like like schweiber and every time i've been there i have like this incredible respect for this water, and in my head, I know what it takes to be successful there, right? Like, man, you got to be there at the right time. It might t- mm-hmm. it might take you forty five minutes to slowly creep your way into a position to get one good freaking cast at the head of a twenty two inch brown wild brown up in this teeny tiny little stream. And that sounds so sexy and so awesome to me when I'm driving there. And then I get there and I'm just like, this, man. We should have went to the Lehigh and stripped some streamers. You know what I mean? So I've been with you on that trip. Yeah, man. You know what I mean? So it's – it's I, I, I don't want to sound hypocritical because I, I fall into this weird spot where, you know – it's like a, it's almost like a, a a laziness thing. It's like I'm I'm no, it's I'm, not lazy. I'm too lazy to do what I need to do for the satisfaction of a big wild brown on the Latour, which I've never caught before. I've never I've never caught a trout there. I've seen them, but I've never caught them. Yeah. But I'm not so lazy that I won't cast a sink tip for twelve hours straight until like I can't move my shoulder anymore. You know? Yeah. Well, you know, okay, so you you raised you hit a number of points there. I'm trying to keep them on my head in in organized form, but <laughs> you know, first of all, I think the best place to be is in the middle, right? So old enough to respect your elders and young enough <laughs> to do wild and wild and crazy shit, right? Yeah, like <laughs> fishing in the jungle and doing stuff like that, right? So I I 50 years old or a little north of there, but uh, not much and. Uh, uh, you know, I, so I, I have respects for the traditions and all that stuff. 
And uh, but I try to be on the edge, like we talked about earlier. Sure. And and and, and I, as as such, I really respect and admire you know some younger, hungrier angler going out and figuring out a technique that they know and they like, and that's their deal, and they go and do it. So see it from both sides and being in the middle is a good place and that's what i was saying earlier about you, if you use yourself are in the middle and you can play all the games that's cool that's point one point two is you go to the latort or someplace like that and i always saw fly fishing for trout there's like four gears or four elements for it right okay. one is the cast right sure you got to make it make a cast you've got to know where to put the cast so reading water you, you need to know what to cast, so entomology and figuring out what bug to use, right? And then you need to have presentation. And uh, what your fly does after it hits the water, I would argue, is more important even than the cast that got it there I, in trout fishing. I would absolutely agree with that. In trout fishing. In salt water, it's the total flip that. Right, of course. Opposite way. Yeah, cast yeah. is important. Right? Just okay. get it there. <laughs> yeah. well, we're talking about trout. Yeah, right. Just get it there. Yeah. But like, so you're, you're, you're cast, you're reading water, where do you cast, entomology. And th- those things are four things that you need to be using in equal measure if you're a traditionalist, right? But then this, some of the streamer game, what you're doing is you're negating the need to focus on the details in some of those areas. Uh, ag- right? Agreed, dude. If I, and I'm sure you've said almost something similar. You take somebody out on a drift boat who's never streamer fished seriously before – they have, right. they have a lot of questions, and at some point I end up saying, don't worry about being pretty, dude. Just f***ing get it there. Just get it, get it on the bank and strip it. Yeah. And figure out if you're going to go eight-inch strips or two-foot strips or what. Yeah. How fast you're going to go. But, yeah, exactly. You could take a total noob, and you could make him a, a streamer fisherman and I, or, or fisherwoman and a damn good one and maybe catch a big old fish in one day, whereas – mastering all those different things, which some might just think is folly, you know, or, or just excessive wasted brain energy. Sure. You know, which is, I totally buy that too. But I think that's really what we're cutting at. You know, if you, if you and where you decide you want to be on that continuum, is totally up to you. That's the beauty of fly fishing at the end of the day is that it can be as technical as you want it to be, or it can be as simple as you can want it, as you want it to be. And you and I, who have fished a lot of places in different circumstances, some days you wake up and you say, this is going to be a technical day. Yeah. And some days you go to the river and you say, shit, we should have gone to the yeah. Lehigh District. <laughs> right? Okay, but then here's a loaded question, right? So mm-hmm. I, I agree with all that, but if you look at the next generation, and, and, and you, know, you, you have a guy who... Uh, you know, he's all about sink tips and streamers and that that's his game. And he's, you know, he's devoted himself to, I only want big trout all the time. The bigger the fly, the better. And let's even say he's successful, but let's say that's all he can do. If you gave the guy a four weight and needed him to make that presentation with a sow bug on the Latour and he couldn't do it, mm-hmm. is he a fly fisherman? I mean, is he a fly fisherman? Sure, he's a fly. He's a fly fisherman, and in, in the way that he he chooses to be a fly fisherman, and that's totally cool with me. And and I trust that the sport is beautiful enough and has enough layers that when he grows up a little bit, maybe, um, he'll maybe find some of the other aspects and want to try a new wrinkle here and there, and will evolve. But do you? And it's, I think it's I think it's in, I think it's incumbent upon the sport to to do that. And and in fact, I would. Take that the other way, and some guy who's a technical dry fly purist, blah, 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 maybe ought to ease off the throttle a little bit and spend a day streamer fishing for the good of the sport. Now, Yeah, but see, you're right, and, and, but, and it is the streamer guy who I feel like overall is more likely to see it your way. But it's the damn – it's the dry fly purist, man. They're the, they're the hardest ones to make – try you know to to the hardest ones like you know we we have some very good mutual friends yep. one of which and i'm not saying names one of the best dry fly fishermen i've ever seen in my entire life right and mm-hmm. we ended up on the water to together once and we were completely blown out we had no choice but to throw streamers on sink tips and like just he was miserable he was absolutely miserable because that 
just did that just was not trout fishing to him. Yeah. You know what I mean? Um, well, you know, again, there's no trout police, thankfully. Yeah. You know, you live like you want to live, man. If you, if you want to do it that way, that's fine. And the other way, where, where it becomes more nebulous and I think a little bit more sketchy is when we're talking about when one tries to impose their brand of fishing in a way and in a time and in a place that might impact the others. Sure. You know, sure. like if you're streamer fishing through my dry fly run or if I'm dry fly fishing and complaining that you're streamer fishing, you know, we need to spend less time figuring out, you know, spend less time worrying about how others fish and and more time figuring out how we can collectively fish together and make the resources better so that there are more fish so that we can all have more opportunity, yeah. in my opinion. Yeah, sure, of course, of course. And I mean, you know, I do think – that over the years you've had you know a few crystal ball kind of moments with with where things are going. So you know that said, okay, you know you, you have somebody who's, who's just a streamer dude. Do you think though that people who who fish that way will, as you put it, grow up, or is this just another carp trend, right? That's in the limelight right now until for whatever reason it's just not the thing to do anymore, or you know, flat brim guy has caught enough big browns and gotten enough likes on Instagram to where people just sort of stop talking about it. So does that next generation that's ate up with the big flies, do they progress or do they fade away? That's why you get the big bucks, Joe. Um, <laughs> do I? Yeah. <laughs> where, are, where are they? Yeah. <laughs> you asked a good question. Uh, all the good questions. I, you know, I think, you know, you and I, if we started out with streamers, we evolved, right? I think if you're into it, you're going to be into it. If you catch the bug in such a way, like I know this young guy, I fished with him. His name is Drew Higgins. He's, 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 he's just a high school student. Uh, I forget exactly what grade he is, but he's, I mean, he doesn't drive yet and, and all that. And he, that, that guy fishes, flat fish. Right. And he's from Florida and, and he saw a lot of fishes, but he got the trout game up in Michigan and I shared a drift boat with him. And, and hey, that guy's going to learn all the different types of fishing because it's in his body. It's in his soul. Right. He's going to do that. And well, and he, he might go through a phase where like all he wants to do is streamer fish. He might want to just only dry fly fish and that's all fine. But he's going to stay. Right. He's going to do it. You know, as someone who wants to just get cheap thrills and be on Instagram with a big fish, they're, and then the streamers, the, the vehicle that gets them that, probably not going to stay. And, yeah. and, and, and I guess I've, I've gotten, you know, we talk about, you know, getting older and softer and all those things. But I, I, I was, I, for so many years, I wanted to be, you know, want to share the sport, want to grow the sport. Want to get more people part- participating in fishing, which is true and good because the more people care about fishing, the more they'll care about the resources, and that's a, that's where my heart is right now. But I've kind of come to a point, to be honest with you, Joe, where I I don't really care how many noobs or how many want to be you know part time you know sure. cheap thrill seekers. I, I don't care how many people uh, are. The the cheap thrill seekers don't matter to me as much now. Uh, where I saw, you know, you have a, throw a great big net before and get everybody in under the tent and, and we're going to see if we can keep as many of them as we can. And now I'd rather just keep the people who actually really do care. Sure. And sure. whether, whether this is a phase or a fad or some of these guys evolve, you know, 10% of them evolve and, and like, you know, become really engaged in the sport and, um, joke about you know 50 years from now these crazy young guys who wear whatever kind of hat and all they do is dry fly fish and you know yeah <laughs> the yeah. cycle <laughs> kicks over and well, you know they return yeah i mean my, i remember i remember back in the day when it was all about the pure fishing of streamer fishing <laughs> and, you know, right no you're right? right and i do i mean you know i haven't, I haven't been around as long as you have but i mean i do think things are are cyclical in a weird way and my only counter argument to 
you know, the, the, the hardcore streamer guy uh, evolving beyond that to wet flies or becoming a really proficient nymph or a dry fly fisherman is that, I mean, like for you and me, you know, we started fly fishing and your first trout on a fly, no matter how you caught it, was so special, right? And then your your first trout on a dry fly, no matter how big it yeah. was, was so special. And then the first yeah. trout on a fly that you tied, which could have been a shitty pheasant tail or woolly yeah. bugger was so special. So my point is there was always like these landmarks that you hit that were like part of your repertoire. And then this streamer phase came along and I got sucked right in. And I was like, oh, this is, this is kind of new. There's some big flies and... I, I, you know, you hit all those memorable fish throughout your fishing career, and now it's like, well, yeah, shit, I'm gonna give, a, I'm gonna give a go at this. Like, let's just try and get a stunner, man. Like, let's just try and get a stunner. But you worked up to that, versus yeah. jumping right into the point where, if you know, one of your first five fish that you ever caught on fly was a 28 incher. It's like. Wait, why do I want? Yeah. Why do I want to go put a nymph on and now catch a thirteen? You know what I mean? Yeah, so well, it, it, it's that's that's my one counter argument to that. Well, I, I'd agree with that. Like, and going back to when I was talking about my son Paul and the elk hunting, like, and in the one hand, it it, it kind of would have been bad if he'd have shot a six by six bull. Yeah, his exactly, first, his first elk in his life. Exactly. Right. So you gotta you gotta walk some miles and you gotta. Walks and rivers, but you know, ironically, when you're asking these questions, I think the first fish I ever caught a fly on was, or sorry, first fly I, I ever caught you. a fish I, on. I got you. you. You had my, you had my back. <laughs> I, I did. Was a was a black woolly bugger. Uh huh. And the biggest brown trout I ever caught, twenty three pounds, in Tierra del Fuego, on a black woolly bugger. It's yeah. Size ten. I mean, it's like it's a part of the the deal, and it's, it's it's part of the fabric and part of the legend. And and and, and if so. I if I had a nickel, as as just like you, every time when like all else fails, no matter where you are, a black woolly bugger is what gets eight. Yet in the in the sort of new world order, how many boxes is that fly not even in anymore? You know? Yeah. Yeah. You're right. You know, you know and you know, the salt the salt and pepper is a, is a real good one. Oh, that was awesome, you man. Know? That was that was like barbaric before it was cool to be barbaric. I was like Well, you know, that that was that was <laughs> the, that was the poor man zoo cougar, right? Right. Because before we had the giant gaudy fly with all the different colors, we had a fly box and we had a a, a white White yep. bugger and a black <laughs> white bugger. <laughs> exactly. Right? And like you're getting really radical, you'd put the black first and then the white and then the white first and then the black, you know, and you make them a foot apart or two feet apart or six inches apart. You know, that that was kind of the precursor to some of these giant sure. streamer right. articulated I, I mean, streamers did, today. Did it did it blow your mind when you first got your hands on some of that earlier gallop stuff? Oh yeah. And I still think it's some of it, you know, some of you just feel like, you know, you got to go to confession after you fish. <laughs> <laughs> That's great, yeah. though, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> sure. Some, some of my best days are days that you feel like you have to go to confession. Well, are you, are you going to have to go to confession in Tasmania? I mean, what's the – I know New Zealand – there's not a lot of streamer fishing in New Zealand, man. That's like sneaky shit too, right? Yeah, so, you know, that's uh, – that's, uh, that, that, that you hit it right on the head, you know. You you kind of went in Rome. You do what the Romans do, and New Zealand, it's all just stock and spot. And you try splashing around with that big streamer stuff there, and then not only will the guides laugh at you, but the fish will laugh. Right, at you. right. So, what's the drill in Tasmania? I think it's a little bit of everything. But what I what I'm told, and the World Championships are going to be there next year. So, you know, some of that. Tight line nymphing stuff, Euro nymphing. Um, we're going to do some of that just to see how it's going to fish. And they, they have a smattering of, you know, smaller streams. And what I hear is really special though is these lakes in the highlands where they have shallows and the brown trout cruise and it's like bonefish. And you oh. will throw them a, 
you know, a, a nymph, like a guild nymph, and twitch it like that, a micro, like a micro streamer. You know, that like doesn't sound like it twitches. sucks in any way, shape, or form. What do I got to yeah. do to get on these call lists, dude? Like, I don't come, like come scotch. I'm sorry, I'm not a scotch drinker. Come on, well, okay, well, <laughs> not sure, I'm sure they have beer there too. <laughs> I I always enjoy having a conversation with Kirk because Kirk is just like so mellow, you know, so even keel, but yet not really afraid at all to sort of tell it like it is. You know what I mean? Like it's it's good to have friends like that. And, you know, I can't stress enough again that the point of this was not to bash streamer fishing in any way, but, you know, that, that article that I talked about in the beginning of the podcast you know, it just it just kind of takes your brain in a different direction. It makes you stop and think like, huh, you know, I've promoted this and promoted this and been all about this. But, you know, here's another side of it. Is this is this new trend, you know, sort of of of, of warping or, uh, you know, causing sort of bad development habits in in new school fly fishermen? And I think that, you know, Kirk's basic point here. Uh, which I, which I agree with wholeheartedly is, you know, it, you're doing yourself an injustice anytime you are, are setting yourself up to be a one trick pony in any fishery or for that matter, I mean, anything in life, I guess. Right. And, you know, there's, a, there's a lot to be said for persistence. You know, you want the biggest brown trout, you want the biggest largemouth bass and, you know, if you devote yourself to the tactics that are weeding out everything else, right, and you, you are just going for the one, okay, I have a lot of respect for that. And I, I've fished that way many a day. There is something to be said. You know, it's always sweeter to get that, that fish the way that you want to get it. If you're willing to sacrifice numbers, to get that one fish the way you want it. I don't think there's anybody out there who would disagree with that. But there's a big difference between only knowing how to get it that way versus doing it that way because you've done it every other way or you know how to do it every other way and you've just decided today I just want to do this. And that's the way that I fish. And I know that's the way a lot of you fish. And, you know, some, some great examples would be tuna fishing for me. You know, when I, when I leave the dock and we're making a 70-mile run, I want to pop tuna. Like, I, I love popping tuna. And, you know, there are some guys who will go out there with popping gear and that's all that they will bring and more power to them. I mean, that's impressive, you know, but by the same token, you also have to recognize that for a million different reasons, there's going to be a lot of days when you're just not going to catch them that way, okay? And I'm not the kind of guy who can go out there and skunk after all that effort of getting myself 70 miles offshore because I absolutely refuse to jig or to chunk or to troll if that's what we have to do. And, you know, it's sort of situational for me in that regard when it comes to streamer fishing. Like on home waters here, you know, home waters, you, you, you fished them all your life. You fished them for a long time. You, you've done everything there. You've seen it from all different angles which to me makes it a little easier to swallow to say, well, I'm going here today and all I'm going to do is throw big stuff. And if something happens, that's cool. And if nothing happens, hey, that's cool too. But, you know, this happened to me just this past May. I ended up in Iowa for a video shoot and it was the first time I'd ever fished the Driftless area. And we were with Hookshots fan Dave Strum, who is a a, a big brown trout hunter to the max. And he throws conventional gear, okay? He's pretty much, he's a stick bait guy. So looking at some of the trout that he had caught out there, knowing that there's some there's some pretty high caliber browns out there, going into that, right, my mission was to stick one of those big driftless browns on a big streamer. And I made a really huge mistake. And I brought nothing but big ass streamers on that trip. I didn't bring a nymph box, you know, I brought one box, 
with all the big stuff in it. And we spent two days fishing out there, and I, nor my buddy Mike Sudall, who was throwing big streamers, nor Dave, whose home waters this was, who was throwing giant stick baits and things, could catch or move one of the really big browns where we were fishing. Now, we had some condition issues, which happens, right? Conditions aren't always what you want them to be. And there's a lot of reasons why that might not work out. But for whatever one it was, we were just not turning any high-caliber fish. Now, the, quote, millennial gorilla would say, well, you just keep throwing that stuff until it happens, man. It's not going to happen if you're not throwing that stuff. You're not going to have... Okay, and that's that's right, all right? But I I hit a point on that trip where I, I said to myself, here I am in this really beautiful, unique fishery in a, in a state and in a place that I've never been to in my entire life. And at some point, it, it hit me, and, and I made a little mental switch and said, well, I've devoted myself for quite a while now to, to trying this with the big streamers here. It's not working. So do I want to scratch, okay, in which case I might not get an episode, but forget even that part, on a personal level, I would like to catch a wild brown trout in the Driftless, just for me, just because I'm here, and a guy, who knows when I'll be back here again. And all I had was that box of huge streamers, and I rifled through it and broke down, and I found the smallest little... There were like three little lunch money shad streamers in that box. And I put one on and I didn't take one off again for the entire rest of that trip, pretty much. And by the end of it, we whacked a bunch of trout. Now, did we whack the 24, 25 plus inch fish that we were hoping for on that trip? No, but I mean, some very respectable, you know, 15 through low 20 inch fish. And, you know, that wasn't the goal at outset, but I walked away really happy. Like, I I got my hands on some really beautiful, healthy, you know, wild Iowa Browns. And I still did it with a streamer. It just didn't happen to be a six-inch long, you know, double streamer, articulated streamer. You know, and and point blank, you, you also can't get too wrapped up. In the cliche that, you know, big flies or big bait or big lure for big fish. that is that true? That's 100% true. That is 100% true. If you're throwing an 8-inch streamer, much better odds that a true tank fish is going to come out and eat that instead of, you know, a 13-incher or whatever. Absolutely true. But it is also not a hard and fast rule. And if you streamer fish long enough, you know that, okay? If I had a nickel for every float I've been on where I'm all jacked up to throw giant stuff and, you know, you do it for an hour, you do it for two hours and, you know, you're not moving anything, you know, you're not flashing anything, just nothing is happening. And and just to change it up, you shrink that streamer down just a little bit, you just go a little bit smaller or even, God forbid, down to something like a plain old zonker or a you know a regular old sculptzilla or something you know fairly small and all of a sudden you start whacking fish and you start whacking big fish because you know one of the things that kirk talked about was you know the the devoted young streamer guy uh you know thinking of things like like presentation Okay, and cast being folly. It's not necessary in their craft. So therefore, they don't care about it. But you know, there are a lot of situations out there in streamer fishing where matching the hatch still becomes important. And one of the best examples I have is on the Upper Delaware system, which I fish a lot. Okay, I was up there a few springs ago. Okay, and I was on the river in one boat, and a buddy of mine was happened to be up there fishing the same river, different stretch on a different boat. And we compared notes at the end of the day. And his boat had thrown nothing but the big stuff all day. And they did nothing. They hardly moved a fish. Well, what I knew, what we knew that he didn't know was that that time of year, the high water in the reservoir tends to spill a whole shitload of alewives over the dam into the river. So now the river is glutted with these half-dead barely twitching alewives 
And what we threw all day was a very small saltwater style, like mush mouth, weightless, tiny little flat white bait fish pattern. And because the fish were being lazy with all that food, you didn't even have to strip the damn thing. You'd throw it on a sink tip, you'd hit it twice, tap, tap, and stop, and just let it flutter down to the bottom, and the damn trout would about take the rod out of your hand. And we caught fish and moved fish that entire float. And I think that's a good example of having that one track mind that we're going out there, we're throwing big, going bigger, going home. Well, you went home empty handed because what you didn't consider was that there was actually in that situation a hatch to match. Anyway, I will close with this quick story just because I think it's funny. You know, I started out in, in the outdoor media world 2005, and back then, you know, you'd get a box from a fly fishing company with some new line to check out or a reel or whatever it may be. And, you know, companies like to promote themselves, and they'll stick, you know, stickers or a lot of times hats in with a care package to media. And I had this whole collection of hats from the early days, which were not that long ago, and you know, these hats would be like something your your dad would wear, like an embroidered, uh, like khaki colored hat with the leather band in the back and like the bill that's a little too long that he bought like on vacation in Cancun. And I remember I'd get these hats and I'd be like, who f***ing wears these hats, right? And I, I never wore them. I thought like these are so outdated looking, okay? Now fast forward just to 2018, okay? Not that much time. The other day, and this has happened multiple times, but the other day I get this care package, and I won't say the company, but let's just say it's a it's a it's a sunglass company, very associated with the fly world. All right, and in with the sunglasses is one of their new hats, and it is a teeny tiny ultra stiff flat brim in one of the most hideous patterns I've ever seen, and I just had to laugh. Because in 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 a, in a short span of time, now it's like if we're sending something to somebody who fly fishes, it's almost it's almost like given that this must be their style, this must be what they wear, and I don't, and you know, no no love lost for all my brothers out there that are into the flat brim life, okay, rock it, I I do not, okay, mostly. Okay, first of all, I don't I don't like a bill that ain't curved. And second, uh, what is with these snap? Like, you have to have, like, a head the size of a softball to wear these snap back hats. I have a big, like, you know, <laughs> I have a huge melon. I put one of these on. It looks like, like it fits me like a yarmulke. So while somebody would have probably enjoyed this hat, I'm not going through the effort of giving the hat away. I am not going to let the hat sit here and collect us with the 4,000 other hats I accumulate throughout the year. And this brand new hat went right in the garbage, which is wasteful. But I just think it's funny that, like, oh, you fly fish? Here's, here's a flat brim snapback, dude. That's, that's what you wear, right? You know? It says a lot. It says a lot about fly culture. Anyway, as always, we'd love to hear your comments on Facebook and YouTube. What do you agree with? What do you not agree with? You know, is uh, is is the uptick in streamer culture, the the young kids that just want to go big or go home, is it good for us? Are they misguided? Let us know what you think. I will catch you guys right back here in two weeks. And as always, thanks so much for listening to the Hookshots podcast.